Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Listeners, we are joined by one of my favorite returning guests this week. But before we bring him back in, I wanted to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. They've got new courses all the time. Some of their new ones include a beginner-oriented course from a friend of the pod, Grandmaster Jesse Cry. Fiona Steele Anthony has a new course out. Fabiano Caruana, for those of you working on advanced aspects of your game, obviously legendary player and opening theoretician, plus much more. So be sure to check out uh, those courses as well as my recommendations, as well as just periodically taking a look around to see what is new from our friends at chessable.com. Now, our guest this week is someone that I interviewed back in 2019. It is an entertaining interview. It holds up well. I was reviewing it yesterday. He is a grandmaster, a FIDE senior trainer, and a FIDE arbiter. He's won various tournaments, participated in the FIDE World Cup. As a trainer, he does a lot of work with U.S. Chess Youth World Teams. He's been a resident at the St. Louis Chess Club, resident GM, I should say. He's been a top 50 player in the U.S., but he's actually based these days in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And I am pleased to welcome back to the program, Grandmaster Robert Ngoski. Welcome, Robert. Hey, Ben. Thanks. It's good to be back. Yeah, yeah. Good to catch up. Uh, no pressure, but I, I LOL'd a couple of times when I was reviewing our interview yesterday. So uh, so pressure's on to entertain again. You ready? I'm good to go. Okay, excellent. Well, you were just telling me some stories before we hit record that we will uh, get to later. But first, I wanted to hear a bit more about your rise up the American chess scene, um, because in our first interview, I found it somewhat interesting that you were emphatic that you have no chess talent. And, you know, for a lot of people listening to hear a grandmaster say that they think that, that, that I think it's called gaslighting these days. They feel like they're being gaslighted if a grandmaster is telling them that they have no talent. But to your credit, you did detail how hard you worked, especially uh, as you got serious about chess in your high school years. You described six to seven hour days um, and you described briefly in our interview that you were born one day before her car Nakamura, who you said was stronger than everyone in your age group. But I'm curious, Robert, who else were your contemporaries and who else made you feel untalented in those days? Oh, man, it was, it was rough. <laughs> it was rough. <laughs> uh, I still maintain that, uh, you know, that theory. Um, but they talk a lot about Magnus's generation, you know, like the, what is it, 93? Uh, what, what year was he born in? But it's like 90 or 91, I think. 91, but, maybe. But it's yeah. ridiculous. Like the, the amount of elite players that were born that year is insane. But I would argue that my year, 1987, and um, I think 86, 86, 87, I think Magnus's 90, 91 um, was also impressive. I mean, when I went to world youth events, you had um, like Andrekin, Vitugog, Vitugov, Lequang Liam, um, um, a bunch of the, like Chinese guys, uh, Wang Yue was there. Um, just guys that there's like at least 20 guys that are 2,700 now. So, uh, and they were already really good, like, you know, 2,600, high 25. So, you know, when you're struggling at the IM level and, and you know, you go see these guys play, you're like, oh, okay, you know, um, they're just seeing different things like the it's like a, a whole class different and yeah and in thinking about sort of when you were born it strikes me that you were kind of like america was really a chess backwater um say 1980 to the early 1990s and then it got in influx of uh soviet emigres and obviously when rex Sinfeld came along the culture really changed but in thinking about when you uh, when you were coming up, it strikes me that you were kind of at the tail end of that. Like, do you think that it was a disadvantage in those days to be from the United States? Oh, man, I don't know. Um, my my first big tournament, you know, that that I went to and felt like, oh, you know, this is really cool. Like, I, I could really get into this was a Pan American that was uh, held in Argentina in 2001. And the U.S. sent a huge delegation. I was part of it. And it had like Joel Benjamin, Jen Shahadi. Um, and it was uh, like hundreds and hundreds of kids from, you know, all the way from Canada down to Argentina, you know, representing every country. And I was like, wow, this is something else. So my experience in the beginning was was pretty positive. You know, I was like, oh, I can be a part of this. You know, I'm I'm cool. Then 
you know, uh, it didn't seem unattainable to play like in a U.S. championship final at that time. It does now, right? I mean, right. it's um, it's like an elite tournament. So in that sense, it's kind of kind of a pity um, because it's just so far that you're like, oh, okay, that's just not going to happen. You still have like the U.S. Open spot, you know, that I've played uh, I've played for many years. Um, so it, you know, there is that sort of Rocky Balboa <laughs> <laughs> opportunity. Um, but overall, I think it's a good thing. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it didn't benefit me, but I think it's definitely going to like ra- rise the level, uh, raise the level of you know American chess for sure. Yeah, it's on an impressive trajectory for sure. And for listeners who did not hear our prior interview, Robert did talk about how at his at his level, um, Robert, forgive me for calling you an average GM. Obviously, that's uh, um, most of us would kill to be average GMs, but. He was saying how he has to be opportunistic about the tournaments he plays. He plays like the continental tournaments to try to qualify for the World Cup, which he has done. And he goes out of his way often to play the U.S. Open because, as Robert just said, that is one of the few backdoor ways into the U.S. championship if you're just not one of the top 10 rated players in the United States. But, Robert, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You didn't make it to the U.S. Open this year, right? No, no. Uh, It's getting hard to carve out that time and uh, the logistics. So, um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm taking my foot off the gas in the U S open for now. Oh, okay. So it's, it wasn't just a one-off. Um, you total. Yeah. I know. I know you have a kid. So, and obviously it's a long way from Buenos Aires, so, yeah. uh, t- totally understandable. And hearing you discuss the U S chess culture, I can't help but think of, uh, the Indian chess culture, which of course we're recording this, uh, not long after the FIDE Grand Swiss, um, concluded, obviously it was, you know, the, the gains they've been making are, we're already well known, but it just seems like the the level just keeps being raised. Uh, what do you think about the rise of the Indian players and particularly the recent success of uh, Vita and Vaishali? Um, one of the really cool things that I got to do uh, like that um, was going uh, as Argentina's uh, Olympic uh, team coach to the Olympia that was held in India last year. I'd never been to India before, and it was like crossing a portal to another dimension. Like, you know, like um, it was the first time that I traveled to a place and felt like I was, you know, I'd gone to Europe. I'd gone to, you know, all places in Latin America. But it always felt like you were sort of more or less in the same culture. Right. And now it was like my first incursion into like Asian, uh, you know, customs and that kind of thing and it was mind-blowing uh i mean at the hotel where i was staying at they were offering free yoga lessons so i did yoga for the first time i'm addicted to yoga now do it oh nice i love it good for you completely changed my life so you know the when we got there the whole city was a, a grinding to a halt for this event uh the chess is held in a very high position there. We would be asked for photos, autographs, uh, all the time. And people would come to the playing hall in you know, busloads to witness it. It reminds you of the golden era of chess. You, know, you see those old photos, like maybe on a Facebook group or page where you, know, you see like Spassky or Fisher playing and there's like 200 people surrounding them. It was that kind of thing. So I think that has a lot to do with it. One of the reasons why, you know, I don't consider myself a talented player, but I think, you know, I, I made a lot of progress was because I was very passionate about it. Uh, I, I would just pour myself into it and there was just no limit. And that's, you know, you, you get that energy uh, with what they did for that Olympiad. Uh, I, that was my first Olympiad that I went to and it, grandmasters that I know that have like 15 Olympiads on them by far the best ever. Wow. Yeah. That, that's fascinating. Yeah. And of course, you have like Prime Minister Modi tweeting to congratulate Vita and Vaishali after the event. And the news just broke that they're providing financial support for all of the Indian candidates qualifiers. So, yeah, I mean, it seems like obviously it's one of these things where you can get sort of like a flywheel or a virtuous cycle where the success builds on the success. And uh, 
you know, good news for India, but the rest of the world's going to need to watch out in the next uh, 10 years or so. Uh, I read an, an interview that uh, Ramesh gave. Maybe, I don't know if it was last year, uh, but I just got my hands on it. And it was really interesting. I mean, I like to hear more about what's going on in that side of the world. You don't hear a lot about Indian coaches. Well, now you do because the players are so good. But most of the time, it's the players themselves that put out like a course, you know, or a video or something like that. But in China also, I mean, who are the, the well-known coaches in China? Do you know any names? I don't. Yeah. India, I know better. Yeah. But, but China? But China, I don't. But, you know, there's a lot going on in China, too. So you're like, okay, who's who's doing all that work? Yeah. And it doesn't really cross over so much. It gets sort of caught in this, you know, cultural net. Um, but uh, one of the things, uh, you know, that I wanted to talk to you about was these seminars that I'm organizing, these coaching seminars for FIDE. And the idea is to try to get people from all these different uh, backgrounds to talk about coaching. Know, what's going on uh try to piece together all the pieces of the puzzle yeah so so tell me more about the seminars um what do you know about feed america uh n i know a lot about america and i know a decent amount about fide but i don't feel like i know that much about fide america <laughs> um so FIDE America is like a bridge between FIDE and all the different federations, you know, in the American continent, right? So it's kind of an umbrella uh, that's in charge of organizing stuff like the Continental, the Pan Ams, you know, all the youth categories, uh, the zonal events as well, right? And on top of that, uh, they also... Uh, create these seminars. Uh, these are called FIDE trainer seminars that if you're interested in, in pursuing a career in coaching and you want to get, you know, a coaching title, uh, you know, you have, you have five different titles, then you have to take the seminar sort of take an exam, fill out an application, a resume and all that kind of stuff. So there's a, there's a big process to be done. And this is the first step you could say. And okay. the only real requirement is that you be 18 years or older and have a FIDE ID. Okay. And I'm guessing it costs a bit of money. Yeah. Uh, it costs 200 euros. And okay. uh, that includes uh, it's eight two hour lectures. And uh, we have a pretty interesting roster. Um, it, uh, it has all the recorded lectures that you can later download as well as supplemental materials that each lecturer might have. Um, but our roster this this year, it's going to be the first English seminar that I'm in charge of. So this is all kind of a new experience for me, too. And I'm trying to think of like the, the people that I would like to listen talk about coaching. And um, for this seminar, we got Shirov, Bolagan, Chaparinov, Kaidanov, who was on your podcast recently, which I heard. Yeah, a good friend of mine, and um, uh, Boykov, Miguel Ilieskas from Spain, Stefanova from Bulgaria, and myself. So we're each going to be talking about you know stuff that we've been working on. That's awesome, and it's two hundred dollars for all sixteen hours, or two hundred dollars for Zero. each eight hour. No, 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 for the whole thing. For the whole thing. That's a that's a, a steal. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, I think it's a it's a good value. You're, you'll get a lot, and it's a tough course. I mean, uh, there's an exam, and there's a form that you know, sort of a resume template that you have to fill out and, and put in everything you've ever done related to chess coaching. So, uh, we're but there's no lower bound rating requirement. No, no, not at all. Uh, okay, I actually, did a seminar in Spanish uh, in October where we had 90 participants and uh, we had them ranging from 1200 to there were three GMs in the seminar too. So as students, yeah, or as, okay. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And can you give a little preview? So you said you're going to be one of the lecturers, like what sort of stuff will you be talking about, Robert? Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, game preparation. 
Right. So I, I got a lot of experience working for the U.S. team at World and Pan American Youth events. And usually we wouldn't have a lot of time to prepare. Maybe you would have 15, 20 minute sessions with each kid for each round, if you were lucky, right? If you had a double round, then you might have to cut down in half. So you needed to give useful information fast, right? So you had to get down to the core. Okay, let's put a game plan, assume this is going to happen. And then, you know, how do you react against that? So that gets tied in with openings as well. So, you know, you need to have an arsenal that you can choose from. And then, you know, the whole process of how to apply it, what tools you have, you know, how to use databases, engines, uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Yada database. No, I'm not. Yeah. So that's um, an online database. It's very good and kept quite current, up to date. Huh. How's that spelled? Um, Y-O-T-T-A. Okay. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. So, th- so is this, would you consider this like a chess base rival slash substitute or supplement or what? Well, I think these days, Lee Chess is chess bases competition, right? Yeah. You can, you can do a lot of the, at least the most fundamental things that you would need chess base for. Now you can do it on Lee chess, whereas before you had no other choice. Right? Chess base yeah. still has a lot of interesting functions, right? Very specific, but that Lee chess doesn't have, but you could have databases and analyze your games in Lee chess without needing chess base at all, right? Which is kind of interesting. What do you tell your students? Like, I mean, I imagine most of your students are young and pretty talented. Mm -hmm. If they ask about getting chess based versus Lee chess studies, what do you advise? Uh, I try to be a minimalist, right? So when I start a lesson, I do all my lessons on Lee chess. So, you know, I'll create a study. Each chapter will be a lesson and then supplemental material games, positions. You can just create, you know, separate chapters as a position. So I try to use as little, uh, as few tools as possible. And also you have the engine sort of embedded in the yeah. US, and now you have this amazing Elite Chess database. Have you seen this thing? Uh, uh, you mean where you can sort by rating level or? Where? I don't know, you, you can put a position and it has a tab you can act. Oh yeah. You know, a regular database, then the Elite Chess database. So all the games ever played on Elite Chess, you can sort of navigate those. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It has huge statistical value, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah, for sure. And then you can actually search for individual players. So it's amazing what they're doing, and it's all free. So, Yeah. Shout out to Lee Chess. Amazing. Yeah. Um, And bringing it back to the trainer seminars, so you mentioned uh, uh, Grandmaster Aliskis. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he has like a big chess institute in Spain, right? Yeah. He's he's kind of an institution in himself. He's like, I would say... Spanish speaking world Yasser. That, yeah. Um, so he's, uh, well, he also was Kramnik's second for many years, right? Uh, and was, I think, top 30 in the world, member of Spain's Olympic. Not, not a bad resume. No, no. I mean, this guy has, he's got all, all the, all the right titles. <laughs> So what did he, did he uh, do one of the Spanish he lectures that was. already took place? He was. And what did he talk about? Um, he actually showed some very interesting functions in chess space that he uses to compile material, right? So I was, um, I usually talk with them a little bit before they start, introduce them and, uh, and also after when they finish. and, you know, Miguel shows this, does a lecture about how to study pawn structures. And I asked him, well, how do you, let's say you want to study this structure, how you go about assembling the material, right? For that like how do you choose games and you're like you see a game and you're like oh this is relevant you know for this and why so there he started using this uh this chess based function to sort of filter uh by structure right and then he kind of keeps whittling it down with filters until he gets you know maybe 20 30 games he plays over them very fast and you know you start developing a pretty good intuition for picking up wow. games. So it's that kind of stuff. I think, uh, you know, if you're a chess coach, if you want to be a chess coach, it's the kind of stuff that, you know, the, the nitty gritty work be behind the scenes that you need to do. Okay. And you mentioned that there's sort of like five tiers of eventual titles and that this one works on the first tier. Mm-hmm. So if someone signs up for it, like, and they're done, they survive the 16 hours. Yeah. 
then, then what happens? Well, you have to take an exam. Like we don't award titles, right? We just offer the seminar. Uh, FIDE does all the titles. So you have to apply for your title like you would for your IM or GM title, right? And it gets approved at FIDE Congress and it goes through all of that. So we walk you through the process. We help you fill out the application and we get it submitted to FIDE. And then it's sort of in FIDE's hands. But um, the only title that you can't get by a seminar is FIDE Senior Trainer. That's That sound you hear in the background uh, is a very popular thing they do in Argentina where a guy with a megaphone on his truck says he's willing to buy your refrigerator. Wow, yeah. that is crazy. <laughs> anyway, I... I got sidetracked. So yeah, what was I so, saying? Um, you were discussing the certification and saying that the right. the so, senior so the, the senior the, trainer that's uh, by resume only. So you you just fill out a form and you send it directly to FIDE if you feel like you have the qualifications if you meet the requirements for FIDE senior trainer. But they're okay. pretty tough. It's a tough title. Yeah, I mean it. It, it makes sense that that it would be tough. And we're recording this on November 15th. Robert, this will likely be out on November 28th. And what were the dates for the seminars again? Um, the registration deadline is December 5th. And it starts okay. on the 8th and lasts through the 10th, 8th through 10th. Okay. And and as you said, if you can't make it live, you can take it asynchronously, as they now call it, I think. Yeah, all the lectures get recorded and they get put up on a drive so that all the participants can access them as soon as the okay. lecture is done. Okay. Yeah. Well, sounds good. I'm interested myself. Um, I assume that's on a weekend. I didn't check the calendar. It's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, okay. It's funny, but I'm like, the certification is, I just want to see the lectures, you know, <laughs> the certification yeah. I could take or leave, you know? I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the roster is impressive. So, you know, you're going to get quality lectures, elite lectures, and then, it also ha helps uh, pave the way for ma uh, maybe a door will open in the future, right? Yeah. And, and you'll have this title and it'll be helpful. Uh, but, yeah. Well, I, mm -hmm. sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. Uh, but it does go up to FIDE trainer, which is the highest title that, that you can get through this process. And that's also a pretty tough title to get. Okay. Yeah. And which, which title are you? I'm FIDE senior trainer. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. It, it's all thanks to, to my students because one of the requirements is you have to have coached somebody that won a world championship, right? Of any age group, but world championship. And I, had, I was just coming off this amazing run at the World Cadets in Brazil that was held, I think, in 2018. And um, one of my students in the under eight category got the gold. And it wow. Yeah, it was intense. It was great. And in our prior interview, you talked about how, like, at these world events, like, you're assigned students, basically, but they're not necessarily your students away from those events. Like you mentioned, uh, coaching a talent, top talent out that Mezkin Amanov normally worked with um, in our prior interview. Yeah, well, that, that, so that's what I'm talking about. That's what it was. OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that's interesting. Um so it could be either way. Like, could Mezgin also, based on the same student winning, have been given the senior trainer title? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and Rob, uh, sorry, go ahead. You know, I was working with him through that period in the tournament, but you know, a lot of the times when you uh, when you go to these events, you're getting students that work with you throughout the year that travel to the event and then they request you to coach them during the event. So there is priority given to people that already work together that want to keep working together during the event. So, you know, sometimes like in this case, you'll get a student that has a regular coach that's not with them at that event. And then you have to, you know, sort of take them, to, you know, walk them through that, you know, experience. Okay. Um, and doing so, I know you coach a lot of teams like that. You're traveling to a fair amount of events, maybe not as many as you used to. But what's you, what's your day to day like, Robert? Are you mostly doing online lessons? I was doing a lot of online lessons, and I'm trying to trying to cut back now. I'm trying to get uh, in, 
involved in other projects, you know, like uh, directing these seminars is something that that's become very interesting for me. I, I like this idea of, oh, I get to pick my own roster, right, for my yeah. my coaching squad, right. This is uh, this is fun. Uh, so you know, I get to talk to people like Shirov and try to convince him. <laughs> Did it take convincing or was he like, He's sure, really let's cool do it? Guy. He's a cool guy. I got to meet him a couple of times. I got to play him a few years ago. Uh, so uh, he was he was really cool about it. So uh, how'd the I, game I, go? I met him in Brazil at this uh, tournament where uh, we were in charge of taking care of him. Uh, me and uh, another good friend of, I just met him there, but there was this uh, GM from Uruguay named Rodriguez, Andy Rodriguez. They're kind of the same age. So Andy, you know, he used to play with Shirov in, you know, under 20, under 18 categories. And uh, so, like, you know, just show him around Brazil. I'm sure, you know, he doesn't get into any rough neighborhoods. So we went, Shirov wanted to go to the beach. And uh, we went there, like, at 9 a.m. I'm very pale. So I'm always, I have, like, the most potent sunscreen on me. You know, I see Alexi there, who's even more pale than I am. You know, he's from Latvia. So I'm like, you know, you should probably get in on this, put some of this on, you know, the Brazilian sun is pretty hot. He's like, ah, I don't need, I don't need this. I'm like, okay. (laughs) No, no prophylaxis, huh? No, man, he was just all (laughs) it. And uh, he falls asleep and wakes up a couple hours later and, you know, he's just red like a tomato. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, he's like, I gotta get out of here. And he goes back to his hotel and, you know, he wasn't getting to the round and the organizer's getting worried. And he's looking at us like, what'd you do with him? Like, where, where is he? And then this towering figure, you know, just moving from side to side, barely able to like move. He was so sunburned. That <laughs> How tall is he? Oh man. He's a lot taller than me and I'm six two. Wow. Yeah. D- did not know that. So he had a rough tournament, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, you know, we got along. He's a very, very humble guy. He was number two in the world and uh, one of the greatest, you know, tacticians ever. So it's going to be interesting to see what he's going to talk about. He's actually, yeah. he actually uh, just got off the Isle of Man tournament. And, you know, I asked him, was, is there anything you want to talk about? And uh, he said, yeah, some psycho- psychological aspects of competition that I experienced at Isle of Man. So he's going to be talking about that tournament. Man, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, What's it like? Like, have you done, I mean, you played him, so you probably did. Did you do postmortems or like analyze with him? Yeah. um, It was, it was an interesting game. I was, it was interesting because I actually had a shot, right? Shiro blundered upon in the opening and that kind of leveled things out. And, uh, then I, I got this, one of the most winning positions I, I've ever gotten. And uh, Shiro found some, some pretty interesting defensive resources. And the game ended in a draw. And afterwards, I, he started talking to me about stuff. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> I called it the patience <laughs> he was saying. I, I, I couldn't really follow. Um, but I think he was just like so upset when he blundered that pawn. Uh, the kind of spiral. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because obviously that's an amazing result, like, you know, to draw a player who was number two in the world, but it sounds like he sort of spotted you a pawn. So, yeah, you know, I get this, uh, I see Ivanchuk play sometimes and you, you get this, uh, aura of, of like greatness. Like you don't know like what these guys are thinking about during a game and it's yeah. not the same thing you're thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> Have you interacted with Ivanchuk? I've seen him play many times, and the one time he asked me what time it was. What'd you say? I didn't have a watch. It's <laughs> <laughs> no so useless to me. <laughs> um, and is there so who are the most? Uh, we've we've talked offline. Uh, you're you're friendly with Ulf Anderson, um, so you've got some good Ulf stories, and you've done a, you've analyzed with him. Um, who are the most impressive people you've analyzed with? So, I mean, we've already got Shirov and Ulf, so I don't know who else you're choosing from as a pool, but I'm just curious. Uh, Granda is very interesting. 
channel is with Julio Granda from Peru. I don't know yeah. If you're familiar with him. Of course. Yeah. Uh, one, another genius level chess player. I think his peak rating was 2699. So it's kind of a shame he never broke that 2700 barrier. But, you know, he would, he would just trade blows with, you know, Topalov and all these guys uh, during the 80s and 90s. So he, he's an absolute legend in, in Latin America. And also you get that, that sense of him just seeing things that you don't see. Uh, with Andy Rodriguez, we, we always, you know, kind of wonder at, at Julio. And he told me of a game that Julio saved against him that was unreal. Um, so I think the game was Rodriguez Granda and Granda finds this ridiculous maneuver to sacrifice an exchange, like four moves down the line to get a less losing position, but where now white has to like play very accurately. It was just like this brilliant, uh, like, like he was just reading the matrix, you know? <laughs> uh, so I, I dig that. Like when I see somebody do that, I'm like, okay, uh, that's cool. And Granda, I know he's still playing some events in Charlotte. Do you know where he's... Is he based in Atlanta? Where is he based these days? Do oh, you know? I don't know. I knew he was living in Spain for a long time. Then he went back to Peru. As far as I knew, he was in Peru. Okay. Maybe he is. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm not sure. And you being from Connecticut, Robert, I've got to ask you about Hans Niemann. I mean, obviously, he's a bit younger, but did you see him like around when when he was young, when you were young and he was younger? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Like last time we spoke, it was before Neiman's big breakthrough, right? Before many things with Neiman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. I remember Hans. Um he he was the same when he was mm -hmm. like ten years old than he is now. So he success has not changed him. <laughs> right. <laughs> um so he's always very confident, very sure of himself. And uh I I met him, I would see him at tournaments in Connecticut, but the first time that I spoke with him was at a World Open. And uh, he came up to me and asked if we could play a couple of Blitz games. And uh, we did. And uh, then we played in the regular tournament also. Okay. So he presumably yeah. sought you out because you were a grandmaster? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll tell you the story. Uh, it was kind of funny. I think it's funny. So, you know, he, he must have been like 10 years old at the time. Right. And, you know, he comes up to me. I'm sitting there with a with a buddy of mine that we would always travel to these tournaments with. And, you know, when you're sitting at the board just waiting for the round to start or something, you're just fiddling around with the pieces. And uh, Hans comes up and it's like, let's play a couple of games, he says. You know, he's 10 years old. It's a, I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? Say, say no? I'm like, sure, let's play a couple of games. And, you know, we start playing and he's, you know, it's intense. It's an intense game. I win the first game. Uh, this is like three minutes, I think. Uh, you know, he arranges the pieces. We play again. I, I win the second game. He gets really upset. He's like, it's like for a GM, you're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, so then we play in the, you know, the regular OTB game and, and i beat him also and uh, you know some years went by and then, then he got me at the u.s open a couple of years ago and he crushed me yeah so okay he got his vengeance <laughs> and what did you think of the whole cheating story oh uh, i don't know i think it was just uh it was hard to watch you know it just seemed like a. uh how, how would you say like a a lot of like yellow journalism uh not a lot of evidence everything handled poorly it seemed like a, a bit of a circus at times and then it all just ended and it was like oh we're actually all friends now <laughs> things fine so you know the whole thing was um uh, i thought i thought hans got a raw deal yeah and, um I, you know, he seemed like he was all alone on for for a while there, you know, like nobody was really stepping up saying, hey, you know, like, where was like U.S. chess? You know, it's like one of our guys, like, where's your, 
where's your evidence? Because they really cut him down at, at a moment where he was just really soaring. Yeah. You know, so, so I was sad to see that. I wanted to see how far he would go. Yeah. Um, well, he's still young. I mean, I, I agree with you, as I've said many times on the on the pod, but um, he's still young. I mean, hopefully, hopefully the, the final story has not been told. Mm hmm. Uh, I hope not. He's, he's still playing very well. Yeah, it's just so hard, you know, obviously at that level. It's just the competition is so tough. I mean, you would know better than me, but. Um, yeah, and what about. Uh, and I mean, uh, the thing about it is you, you got to give it every single second you have, right? It's it's all the time you're you're thinking about it. So, you know, as you get older, I don't think the limitation is physical, but, you know, you begin to sort of branch out. You know, maybe, you know, family work, that kind of stuff. And uh, you just can't keep up. Yeah. Did you have, can you recall a moment? I know you describe yourself as late bloomer, no talent, et cetera. But do you, That's, can you, can you think of a moment where like, you said. Put it down like, like Tinder profile. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um but, but was there a moment where you you said you, you felt like, OK, I'm recalibrating my ambition. You know, I, I'm taking my foot off the gas in terms of the competitive aspect of chess. Yeah. The interesting thing about chess is that it has so many different areas that you can explore. Right. Aside from just competition, you know, there's there's coaching, there's publications, uh, you know, uh, there's organ organizing tournaments. There's, you know, being an arbiter. So if you want to make a career out of chess i think you need to make like a mosaic of these things you know you need to dip into all of them and explore them because um you don't want to just always be leaning on the same thing over and over again it gets kind of tedious and boring too so when did you make that determination oh, i mean i i think it, it kind of takes you you know uh you, you just uh, start seeing opportunities or doors that open and you just explore them without really knowing where it's going to go. I mean, you, you know, with, with your podcast, it was probably something like that in the beginning. Like you just thought it would be interesting. Yeah, for sure. Didn't really have certainty as to, you know, how it would end. But, you know, if you're always just doing stuff, you know, constructive stuff, you know, uh, improving yourself in some way or, you know, stepping outside of your comfort zone, at some point, all that stuff comes back. In a positive way, I mean, you yeah. know, it's, it has to, right? <laughs> right. And so, out of out of all the hats that you wear, you know, arbiter, trainer, um, trainer of trainers, um, <laughs> content creator, etc. Like, do you have a favorite? Oh, the GM title, of course. I mean that uh, that was uh, blood, sweat, and tears. So, yeah, I put a lot how, into that. How many years did you feel like you were? like pers actively pers i mean obviously it's probably like a lifetime goal but yeah like jesse cry has like the stories where he decides he's going for it was it like a conscious thing that you were going for it or were you just playing chess and hoping to get there um i was playing chess and hoping to get there because that's how i got to i am and uh i was having a really hard time like moving past i am and, and that's when i met uh william lombardi and that's when like the gm title became like oh no like you have you need to do this. Like, yeah. Um, and for listeners, uh, Robert told some great stories about how, like, uh, Grandmaster Lombardi, who, of course, legendary American player, contemporary of Fisher's, um, sort of guided him and helped him push through a plateau. Um, Robert met, had mentioned in that interview, um, particularly by focusing on, like, not screwing up the same way twice, if I'm uh, paraphrasing correctly. But Robert, before we were recording, you were also telling a story of a, a, a trip you took. I don't think, I don't think my interviews are going to translate too well in print. <laughs> I, I, uh, I clipped one of you. <laughs> I clipped it and uh, put it on Twitter. Uh, one of the stories you told, in, in addition to your trashing my system, people, you know, people seem to enjoy it. So. <laughs> All right. Um, but, uh, but you were telling the story to me before we recorded of taking um, a trip with uh, a memorable trip with Grandmaster Lombardi. Yeah, this is when I was living in New York. I was uh, studying at CCNY. And I was working as an EMT on the weekends, too. And uh, I would meet up with William once a week. We would have dinner. Talk about 
probably chess was a minor topic. And uh, it was around midterms, and uh, I got a call from him on Tuesday. He's like, I got invited to go to Dresden on Thursday. You want to come with me? And we'll be back Monday. So I'm like, what's going on in Dresden? You know, there's this events, led, events for the legends or something like that, where they have an open invitation. They did this every year. I don't know if they're still doing it. I don't think so. But it was an open invitation to any GM over the age of 70 to go with one person with a plus one to this uh, weekend where they would have, you know, uh, blind, uh, they would have simul, they would have like these uh, giant chests, you know, like with people as pieces. And uh, I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's see, see what's happening there. And I get there and, you know, Spassky's there, Taimanov is there, Ivkov. Um, all these, you know, absolute legends. So I got to hang out with them for three days, and it was spectacular. It was surreal. Uh, you know, I, was, I would just be riding the bus with Spassky, just talking with him. Uh, Lombardi, I remember one time he was trying to teach. He was always trying to teach me like Russian, and you know, he'd be saying words or pointing at something, and he was trying to say uh, somebody was smoking a pipe, and he was pointing at the pipe and he couldn't come up with it. And then Spassky just like sneaked up behind him and, and whispered pipe to him in rough, huh. which I don't really remember how to say. It. I don't know if it was you, you or something like that, but um, yeah, that, that was a great trip. And that's what, and, the- and that's maybe the first trip where I didn't play that I had a great time. And I was like, Oh, you don't really need to play. To- <laughs> And that's how you got into uh, to coaching, I guess. Um, no, I was already coaching, uh, maybe not at full steam, but I, I already had some students, and I had traveled to some tournaments as a coach. So okay, yeah. And did Spassky tell any standout stories in your your bus rides with him? Uh, mm, I I became pretty good friends with his stepson who was there. Uh, Alexander, and I remember at night, all all the old guys would go to bed, and we would just go out on the town. Nice. Uh, so we would just leave Lombardi and Spassky tucked in, and uh, we'd be off. So, uh, no, I don't. I mean, he told some stories, but you know, some stories I had already heard, and he showed some games. I was uh, I was kind of like a kid in a candy store. I was. Just running around talking to everybody. Amazing. And how was uh, Dresden? How was the nightlife in Dresden? Unbelievable city, beautiful. Really? Lovely. Yeah. What are your What are your favorite places you've been for chess? I mean, you must have been like everywhere. Um, I really like Latin America. I spent a lot of time in Brazil. I like Colombia. I would say of of Europe, Dresden is probably one of the cities that that impressed me the most. But um. I, I don't know. I've, I've never been, you know, a lot of chess players think that when they have to become professionals, they need to go tour Europe, you know, or that kind of thing. I never really got that. Uh, I don't know if that, you know, had a positive or negative impact on me, but I was never that drawn to it. I mean, Latin America just fascinates me. I, anytime I can travel, I just want to pick, you know, a country in Latin America that I haven't been to nice. like yeah. there or revisit, you know, places like Brazil or Colombia. Yeah. You're making me want to travel. Um, oh, yeah. And I correct me if I'm wrong. Your mom is Argentinian, mm-hmm. um, dad American. So obviously it makes sense that you speak Spanish and English. But uh, how did you pick up Portuguese? Oh, it's just it's very similar to Spanish. So if you spend a couple months in Brazil, people are so friendly. They'll, they'll teach you right away. Like you'll pick it up. You'll be talking with people all the time. So just the social interaction. You'll, you'll learn it almost by osmosis. You, you will. I don't know about me. Oh, but... well, you should give it a try. Uh, I think <laughs> okay. uh, Brazilian people are like the happiest, nicest people I've ever met. So everything is easier there just because the energy is so positive. That's awesome. Um, all right. Uh, Ulf stories. It's time, Robert. So what was your last interaction with Ulf Anderson? I invited him to to Buenos Aires to celebrate his 70th birthday here. Uh, so 
So he came, it was, this was a, maybe, uh, it was during the pandemic. It was so hard because we had to fill out all these permissions and ask for permissions, fill out all these forms. Uh, but we, we got it. Because Ulf was going to spend it by himself there in, that, in that town in Sweden that he lives in, Arboga. If you Google map it, it is in the, in the woods, man. Like, it's out there. So, uh, we're like, Ulf, come down here. He's got a bunch of friends here in Argentina. We did a huge 70th birthday party. Had a great time. Wild party or no? Not Dresden wild. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was Ulf appropriate. Okay. And what's it like to analyze with him? Hmm. Everything's got this nice flow when he's looking at things, right? Like, like the, the road is already laid out in front of him and he's just taking the, these little baby steps down this, this path that can't be, you know, you can't stop him. Uh, cause his understanding is so deep. It's almost like, well, now he's getting older, right? So, um, maybe you know as you maybe it doesn't have to do with age as much as it does with not competing so much that your senses aren't uh your sense of danger in some positions maybe is not as sharp as when you're playing tournaments consistently right so sometimes you know you, you'll find that your ideas uh get tripped up along the way but the idea is good there's just some kind of tactical nuance Right. But once that's corrected, then the idea keeps flowing. So with Ulf, it was always like, I'll show him a position and I'll know what the right path is because he'll tell me instantly. Like he, he never seems to make a bad strategic decision. Right. It, it, he does it naturally. Uh, it's like the wrong option is not an option. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was always very comforting, like knowing, oh, okay, I need to know what to do in this position, I just show it to Ulf and he'll come up with something. And did you feel like, so and obviously on a- Without an engine or anything, right? Then, you know, yeah. I, I, would, I would check stuff with the engine later. Wow. So on a micro level, that's obviously going to be insanely helpful within a given position to be able to just show it to Ulf. But did you feel like he was able to sort of... um in part big picture chess lessons to you or did you feel like it was something innate that that you know couldn't be passed on that easily um there's definitely something innate there because also it happened to me with lombardi he was uh lombardi could talk for hours and hours and hours but when it came to explaining chess stuff he really didn't use words like he would rather just show you like he would just say let's play this out let me beat you 10 times in this position so that you start. So it starts like getting into your head how this works. You know, like um, he would quote Hans Kamak, who was the manager of the Marshall Chess Club back in the thing in the 50s. He says, you got to think with your fingers, right? You, huh. you got to get the sort of like the muscle memory, like your fingers should know before your head does, like what the right move is. And, and I've, I've heard, you know, Magnus and Anan say similar things, you know, like I think Magnus said something like usually the first move that I see is the move I'll play or the correct move. And then I just spend a little bit of time checking it. Uh, so, you know, trusting those first instincts is increasingly important. The more time you put into chess, right? Cause that's gets stored in your fingers. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, my fingers aren't very, uh, aren't very strong, unfortunately, but <laughs> But I, I love I love the uh, analogy, um, and so with your students, Robert, uh, I'm guessing you get some parents asking you like, what should they be doing aside from their lessons? What what's what's your stock advice for them? I mean, tactics is still so important. Um, I I feel like the the way chess is studied is is going to be changing a lot. You know, the way chess is played has changed dramatically over the last 10, 15 years. But I feel like maybe the coaching techniques haven't changed that much. Maybe now with Chessable, you start seeing people experimenting with different formats and systems for learning. Um, but, you know, I've been changing how I do lessons, right? Uh, the way that I do a lesson now is not the same as 10 or even two years ago. Uh, 
now I like to sort of get in to that, of, to stay in line with that principle of, you know, how do I help someone think with their fingers? Right? How do I give them that experience? So I experiment, you know, with the different techniques, like sometimes, you know, have the student play a game while, you know, we're, and share the screen while, you know, we're doing the call and just walk me through. Like during a game, what moments do you think are, are key moments? You know, at what point do you feel like you're out of book? At what point do you feel like you lose the thread of the game? And then you go back and you sort of check that, you know, see what instincts were right, which ones were wrong. And, you know, reinforce the good stuff, trying to pluck out the bad. But, you know, there's all these tools online now that when I was, you know, first starting out, there was none of that. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. you know, it's easy to get overwhelmed by information. And for you, do the neural nets play a role in all of this? Like, how do, what's your recommendation for how to interact with, with engines generally and um, with, with, like, and are neural nets in particular changing anything? The, the engine is a fun toy, but it has sharp edges, right? So you have to be careful how you use it because... It can end up uh, killing your creativity, right? You, you, like for me, that's why it was so important to show Ulf or Lombardi these positions because they they weren't contaminated by mm -hmm. the engine. They had all of this old school knowledge that I wanted to tap into and sort of modernize, but I didn't want to contaminate it with the engine. So I would have these positions that I would show them, uh, and then I would check. You know, I would write down all the stuff that we would go over and then I would just check that with the engine and see, okay, what, what stuff holds up? Where are the sort of potholes? Um, and, you know, you, you just try to give it a, a technological coding armor, you could say. So you, you, I mean, that's, that's obviously very instructive for how you pursued chess, but what about your students? So do you also, you try to, so, you try to have them not use the engine right away? Oh, I don't, I don't, I have this, the option disabled for the engine. Okay. For so, so the idea is to always sort of get you, you want to be Ulf, right? You want to be Lombardi. You want to be that guy that, that just chess flows for you. And in order to do that, you really need to get inside your head and you know, experience positions and, you know, realize what some of the subtleties are, some of the general patterns are, and that takes time, right? So, uh, you, you don't want to be, to use the engine as a crutch. Uh, you want to use it as something that will check what theory, whatever, whatever three theory you came up with, right. Or assessment you came up with, and then you want to turn it right back off. Uh, okay. So that's how I use it. Uh, I, I I don't have it on all the time. Uh, I think that's terrible, especially like when you're doing game analysis. It's terrible too. Okay. Good advice there. And and we have another question. This one is from supporter of the pod, David Lazarus. Thanks for helping to support Perpetual Chess, David. And he asks, uh, how many black defenses to the main openings you suggest for your students? Um, I don't, I don't know if I really have a number. It depends where the student is at, right? I mean, uh, if it's a competitive, uh, student, you got to have at least two, right? And, uh, I'm a, I'm a big fan of practical openings. I'm not a, you know, uh, one of those guys that's a lifelong knight or player. Like, I don't, I don't think that that stuff works anymore. So I just finished doing a course uh, on the Lowenthal Sicilian, which I think is like, the greatest. Uh, God, I, you got to remind me which Sicilian that is. This okay. is embarrassing. So, you know, you go E4, C5, Knight F3, Knight C6, right? Mm -hmm. And now after D4, takes, takes, instead of Knight F6 or E6 or, you know, all these uh, main moves, the move is E5. 
That's not the Kalashnikov or? Well, after knight b5, d6 would be the Kalashnikov. Ah, okay. If you go a6 and allow the knight to go in. Oh, the, yeah, that seems terrible. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've, never, I've never understood. So that's what you're playing. That's my damn. <laughs> and I remember in the lecture you did for Patreon subs, you're also a fan of this uh, Philidor line with the early queen trade, right? I'm done. I'm done with the Philidor. Forget that. Okay. Oh, and all now. <laughs> you like all the painful, the painful openings. That's funny. Yeah, um, and, I'm, and in case you you have some problems with D four, I got the Chigorin ready to go as well. So D four, D five, C four, Knight C six. Wow, all the dodgiest. <laughs> That's funny. But easy, it's uh, easy. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. And does that advice change based on whether you're working with like a top? Young talent, do you, I don't know if you work with any adult amateurs, but versus like adult amateurs. No, I, I wouldn't corrupt the youth that way. This is just for, you know, jaded uh, adult learners that want to have a okay. good time. No, uh, it's, it's, I like these lines because they're not refuted lines. And they're very useful if you're playing in a lot of tournaments, right? So I have a lot of students that play in a lot of tournaments and they need to avoid preparations and you need to get preparations in. So I have, I try to comb through lines that enjoy bad reputations, but that aren't as bad as their reputation. That's what I'm looking for, right? I'm looking for something that's going to be underestimated. Uh, okay. And and these openings that I'm telling you are like a perfect fit. Uh, for yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to play in sort of league games, but basically fit that exact criteria where you're, there's a relatively small pool of players. Mm -hmm. So if you just trot out the same stuff, uh, you can be a bit of a stationary target for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I mean, it's it's good to to mix it up and get new things in the roster, right? If you, yeah. You, your brain starts to ossify if you just do the same thing over and over again. You, I think there's an error in logic that is like, if I play this opening enough times, then I will know it perfectly. Right. Right. And that it doesn't work that way. Actually, after you hit a certain peak, your understanding of it starts to go down because you're almost on autopilot. You're you're not even thinking about some of the moves anymore. So that's usually time to change. Mm. Bring in something new. You'll never do you everything have anything perfectly. Right. Do you have any other sort of stock advice for um for adult amateurs? Um, tell me some of the common problems. Well, everyone, for example, everyone's wondering about how to play against kids now. Everyone's complaining about rating deflation. Um, I don't know if you have any s specific advice for, like, like should should adults, um, consciously try to avoid complications against what they may perceive to be younger or sharper players. I think you. That's when having these practical openings is good. You need to sort of uh, make sure that they don't get to choose the path, right? Just you, you have to bring them to your ground and fight on your home ground. Uh, I saw this. Uh, do you like tennis? Yeah. I saw this great documentary about Boris Becker. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, no. It's called The World Against Boris Becker. Phenomenal. You should check it out. And it, it took me down this Boris Becker rabbit hole. And I started looking at these interviews that, that he gives on. They're all on YouTube anyway. And I hear this guy talk about tennis. And I think he's talking about chess, right? So wow. uh, he's talking about the serve, right? He's saying, okay, the serve is... Like, if you have a really good serve, people kind of look down on you in a way. Like, you're compensating with, like, a super serve. And... You know, maybe a deficiency that you have, or you know, like the best servers are not the best players in the world, right? If you right. Think of, uh, Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic, they never had the best serve, uh, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, Becker says it's the most important shot in the game, and the opening is the same thing in chess, right? It's the only shot that you control that you get to sort of decide on what terrain or what area you're going to be focusing on. So. That has to be the focus. Just like in tennis, you know, there's a stigma. In chess, it's even more so. Like if if you if you recommend somebody study openings, you're like a bad person. You know, you're, you're like, no, you have to study end games and 
and tactics and tactics is true but i mean the opening is it's absolutely fundamental um i don't think you can start you know you're off on the wrong foot if you mess up the opening and you can learn a lot of strategy if you really understand the openings that you play you're off on the wrong foot if you don't play the lowenthal you are and uh, <laughs> you can buy my course here <laughs> <laughs> you're you're just kidding, right? But you are working on a course, right? Yeah, yeah, it'll be done any minute now. <laughs> uh, no, I am, I am, all, I am done. Like the material is done. I've actually recorded it, which I thought would be the hard part. But now I have to annotate like a PGN file, and that's that's killing me. But I'll get it. Gotta get. Yeah, just gotta get off on the case. Oh man, I don't. I wouldn't do that to Ulf. <laughs> uh, I just um, have to put the stuff that uh, was on the video more or less into words and uh, okay. writing a paper. Cool. And you said that's going to be on modern chess, that course? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. couple more questions, Robert. Who is the most impressive Blitz player you've ever seen? Um, I mean, in person or forever? That's Let's do both. Well, I, I saw Hikaru play in person, and I thought that was that was pretty special. Uh, but just watching Magnus play at the World Blitz and Rapids, it's like uh, I really enjoy watching those tournaments, watching him play. He's so cool. watching online, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I would say Magnus. It's just a pleasure to see him play. And what about that you've played against? That I've played against. Um, Probably Hikaru. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't doesn't get doesn't get much better. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, and Robert, in our first interview, you talked about being an avid reader. Um, I know for a lot of us, like our chess reading can fall off as uh, as we get older. Are you keeping up with the literature much? Not at all. I haven't touched the book in years. Um, I do have what to me is like my little chess bible, which is Kasparian's. Uh, domination. Yeah. Endgame, endgame book. Yeah, that book gets recommended a lot. I always have to warn readers not to just buy the one on Amazon because it's kind of a crappy version, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah, the um, old but, cover. Oh, awesome! Yeah, I should like set an eBay notification or something and tr try to get my hands on one. Yeah. So, are you generally a believer in endgame studies? Uh, that for listeners, that that's a compilation of of endgame studies. Yeah, I love Endgame Studies. I like the, the the theme of domination of this book. I don't think it's been explored that much. Uh, like it, it hasn't been assigned as its own, you know, topic. Usually, right. you might see it as a chapter in a tactics book. But I remember Lombardi told me like it was the essence of the game. Like it was domination. Like all these players that win by submission, uh, you know, they it's in their DNA. Like they're just shutting you down piece by piece. You know, that was like the old school way. And I think there's a lot to it. I mean, you know, chess has been modernized, but having that, that sort of skill, um, it, it gives you like a lot of margin, right? Like now they really have to beat you tactically to win the game. Cause you know that it's not going to be by submission. Like you, you see those patterns coming a mile away. Okay. Yeah. And you should probably explain that by domination, it's not what someone might think. It's not crushing someone. It's, it's to restricting them. Yeah. Like if, if you, if you're into, you know, MMA, it would be like a knockout against, you know, winning by submission, right? Mm -hmm. uh, tactics would be a knockout. Domination would be by submission, you know, getting in Zugzwang, just not having to tap out. Yeah. So yeah, again, just just to explain for listeners, so the book is called the 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 book is called Domination because the studies revolve around um, positions where like uh, a knight just runs out of squares, sort of thing. Um, but but yeah, I've got I've got to get the actual book for, uh, for sure. To me, probably the 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 best claim you know for chess as an art would be that book. That is okay. I consider it a word of art. Great book. And. In the period you described in our prior uh, interviews where you were reading chess six, seven hours a day uh, during during your high school years, like or doing chess, like what else what else did you do? How else did you immerse yourself? Um, I mean, chess was it. 
it was either playing tournaments, studying chess, hanging out with chess players. Uh, it, it was uh, there, there wasn't a lot of room for anything else. You know, I would I would do sports and stuff like that, but it would be with chess buddies. We would just right. get together and go, you know, play soccer or something, and then go back and study chess. Uh, so I, I'm not sure, like, what? I just meant, like, what were you doing for the study? Oh, uh, for the study. Well, this was way back in the day, right? This is uh, yeah when, you know, the informant would publish, you know, the encyclopedia of chess openings like and everybody was waiting for it all that stuff is, is gone now so a lot of this the time that i would spend would, would be uh maybe like a busy work you know like setting up the pieces and and playing over uh games like if i'm reading a book i'm just doing it cover to cover right yeah so i'm just playing over all the games and actually reading the book if i'm doing puzzles i'm setting it up on the board um but I remember I, w- I was very heavy on openings to a to a fault, like I was just obsessed with it. I just felt like I, I could know it all, <laughs> <laughs> and it was fun to me. I, I just enjoyed doing it, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, I think that it's such a long haul that you should just pursue whatever you part of the game you enjoy the most, and yeah, and you know, just get your fill. And of course, you know be as well-rounded as you can but for me it was always openings okay and oh. not tactics like i really didn't like doing tactics hmm. did that ever change or not really no it got worse <laughs> <laughs> um all right well robert always so many fun stories um we should remind people about the fide seminars any anything else before we we let you go i don't know i don't think so i mean i'll i'll, I'll be back in the future and we'll talk about that. that would be great yeah yeah uh, definitely um so i'll uh robert you can just send me whatever info people need about um about the seminars in order to uh submit their applications to to attend on december 8th and um and are you taking students robert if anyone wants to learn the lowenthal no <laughs> no not right now no no i'm really i'm trying to focus on uh on you know doing the seminars and and trying to step away from private coaching and maybe take a step back and see you know which directions you know this chess thing can go in because i've been doing the the lessons for the past 10 years or so so i'm like okay i've i've really explored that it's interesting i i still do some i have some students but i'm i'm trying to again take my foot off the gas not to stop that but maybe to you know go in a different direction okay Sounds good. All the more reason to uh, to have you on the pod again sometime so that people can uh, can pick your brain. Um, all right, Robert. Well, thanks. Um, I'm going to I'm I might sign up for that seminar myself. I, I've got to give that some thought. But uh, yeah. but like I said, all, all the details will be in the show notes. And, and thanks again for coming on. Anytime.